Ha! It could be that people could not see us and only could hear us. Ah, uh, I did something wrong in OBS. So people are just now seeing us, I think. Oh, it's like I'm doing this for the first time, of course. Uh, I, I wanted to say every time you're going to mention some scrum term, I'm probably going to hook into that because I've just had two days of uh, PO training, mm -hmm. which is uh, a lot of theory and practice is always different, I guess. <laughs> so that's rather interesting. Uh, we have our first viewer, at least in the chat. Hi, Yakim. Thanks for joining us. If you Hi. have any questions for Sarah, please ask them because that's what she's here for, answering our questions. So that's good. And if you have questions, Sarah, you're welcome as well, of course. But yeah, I, I have so many. Um, so you said you've you've been doing this or something like this for about seven years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So um, what what's your background? What did you do before this? So I actually studied in Belgium and I studied a combination of design and development. And uh, it's this really three year oh, yeah. intense study. There. Sorry to interrupt you, but y Yakim says they, and I, I'm very aware oh. of your pronouns, um, but I don't get much practice. So I'm probably going to say it wrong a few times and, and feel yeah. free to correct me on that because I want to practice and I want to learn. Um, and there's probably room for improvement. So let's, let's just <laughs> call it that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so yeah, also, Sarah. Thank you. Um, yeah, for anybody who's, who's watching or listening, that's also good to know, I guess. Um, so you were studying in Belgium, sorry? Yes. Uh, so combination of design and development. And that's really, like at the end of that, I tried to do a bit more design-oriented work during my internship. And that's when I came to Norway. And then I realized I was really missing the development part. So then I started working as a front-end developer at a design agency. And through that, I was at uh, some different companies, mainly with Cisco. Uh, they were a big client of ours, where it was really like working in Scrum-based, working in teams, and um, like that kind of approach. And after a few years of being there, I realized I wanted to get more into the data side of things, because I really enjoy working with data, and I could see myself um, not necessarily being a machine learning engineer, but someone working more closely with machine learning engineers as a UX designer or as a front-end developer. So then I switched to a company that was called Onco Immunity that made uh, or makes uh, machine learning software for cancer research. And I was the main UX designer and main front-end developer there. And that was a very interesting position because I could talk with all the data engineers. I could talk with all the bioinformaticians, but um, immunologists, with cancer researchers, and then bring all of that together. And then I had to make a front end that visualized all the big data that was coming out of their predictions. Yeah, but you and had no I, other designers or front end developers to, to yeah. learn from or anything. <laughs> yeah, but it was really good practice because that's actually how I also got into accessibility because we did get some accessibility practice in school. Like we had to write semantic HTML and they would validate it and if there were errors in the validator, they wouldn't even review our assignment and stuff. So I still had accessibility background, but only to that extent. I had never tried a screen reader before. I had never had to think about it before that much because in all the other teams, I was in a more junior position and other people had set the requirements or other people in code reviews would fix it or bring it up. And now I was in this place where I was like, okay, I have to make graphs. What's necessary for that? And then while I was designing them, I was like, but wait, this is visual. Th things can go wrong here. And then I started looking into more, what about data vis accessibility? And when reading up about that, I also became way more interested in accessibility in general, because it was like, oh, well, this is actually a bit more than just what we did in school. I have to think a bit more. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty big, actually. Yeah. yeah. And like, that was also very interesting because I think if I go back to that code, it will probably not be very screen reader accessible because there were so few articles out there about it. And especially when it comes to screen readers, like I followed the documentation of D3 when making my first graphs. Yeah. And I was like, I must be fine. I did exactly what they told me to do in the documentation. I'm good here. And then afterwards I realized when running a screen reader on the documentation, that the documentation isn't screen reader accessible either. <laughs> yeah, that's that's often the case, yeah. right? Even the things that we yeah. get thought are, are not uh, the way they should be. Like, 
whatever examples we get. They're not actually good examples to start from. Yeah. yeah. I've noticed that with other accessibility issues as well. Like when I pointed out to a designer, like, hey, I don't think this design is very accessible when it comes to color contrast or like text on the background. And then they replied, oh, I didn't know that. I thought I was doing the right thing because I copied from what Facebook and Instagram are doing. Yeah. And I was like, I can understand why people make that mistake, but it's also really so much on the big companies and the makers of libraries and educations of it, it's a lot their responsibility as well to integrate yeah it. they they give such a large example that we can follow yeah. um but it still requires us to uh, to think about the things ourselves i mean where i work we we used to uh, do a lot with uh, material design mm -hmm. but that was like from the start and there was so many things that that could have been better like um the first material design inputs they had these floating labels with inputs mm -hmm. that's just such an anti-pattern and it's been tested and and i think half the internet has has fell over this issue uh, mm -hmm. by now but um yeah they don't do that anymore and one day a designer came to me and they showed me like the most basic input you know like a, a text field with a label above it and a description below it and they were linked together mm -hmm. in code and i was like yes this this very basic input this is what we want this is actually yeah. accessible and usable by people and people will actually recognize it because it's more than mm -hmm. just a line that you can put text on yeah. um but that's that's the risk you know if you start copying other things then you think ah oh, they're yeah. smart people they probably did it well and it's not guaranteed mm -hmm. yeah and then what kind of yeah, resources did you dive into what did you say what kind of resources did you dive into uh, so in, in that specific job, I didn't really find the right resources for the screen reader accessibility because I was still a bit junior and I didn't know too much about that part. I just thought I'm following the docs. I'm doing the right yeah. thing here. The safe yeah, thing. I did, yeah. Look, yeah. I did look a lot at like more uh, the cognitive load of it, of like how to easily convey it and how to make sure everyone understands it and how to also like with color contrast and patterns and that stuff because it's... A big advice that you often get is add patterns on top of colors uh, to make sure that for colorblind people, it's also still uh, visible in your graph, which area is green or which area is red and so on. And that's one of those things like, yes, you can do it, but then you also have the other side of the picture that it becomes super busy. So then it increases the cognitive load and yep. trying to find a good balance there. That's really challenging and, and really fun, actually. I, I know this... Uh... I think I asked it a few, a few weeks ago on Twitter as well. It's an a advice that you often get, you know, don't uh, uh, use color alone. So you're going to add mm -hmm. a pattern. But are there any well-tested patterns? Are there like good practices or examples that you say, hey, I can use this pattern? Um, there is someone who made a pattern library for that, but I cannot remember the name or the name of the library. Of course not. <laughs> uh, but I usually try to go for something that's very subtle and very, that's like not too many flashing. No uh, harsh colors. Like, yeah. Um, so that's one thing I try to do, but I also like just try to user test it very often. And there's also color combinations that you can use where, uh, for example, blue and red is a very popular one where it's fine unless you're uh, fully colorblind, so you cannot see any color. Um, but even with those, if you go for a high enough contrast, you might still be able to solve it if you want to stay away from patterns. Yeah, you can but still I have a, a contrast between yeah. the lines, basically. Yeah, exactly. But I also try to look at it as when a graph becomes complicated enough that you need different colors or different patterns, maybe the graph is becoming too complicated. And I look at it as, is there a way I can simplify this so I do not need the different colors? And maybe I split it up in two different graphs. Does that make sense? Which makes so everybody I, happy. Yeah. I mean, simplifying yeah. data is like yeah. always a win, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I noticed that so much, especially in the job where I worked with cancer research, because when we started out, I got, uh, I used the people inside the company as like user tests. And I often got the thing of like, oh, but that's okay. We often work with data science. We're used to seeing those graphs all the time. Don't worry too much about making it too complex. And then you go to someone like an actual end user and they're like, yeah, I understand what this is, but I don't want to look at something that difficult. I just want you to tell me the answer. Just tell me in words what it's like. I don't want to look at a graph and try to decipher it. 
Like they, we they ask don't, people. Yeah. They have a question and they don't want a puzzle. They just want an answer. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I, I often feel that the best data viz examples are the ones where there's not that much data viz going on, where you can really manage to simplify it enough that you're just really giving the people the answer that they need. Yeah. So but it's, then also the use case, of course. There, there's a sort of user journey in there, I guess. Yeah, I think uh, when it comes to the election graphs that I wrote about a while ago, so I uh, yeah, listened to that You, you looked at like all these different US yeah. election graphs, like from yeah. newspapers and, and news resources and everything. Yes, and one of them actually solved it in an interesting way. I think it was uh, 538. Yeah. And they do these uh, election predictions. So they run a lot of different prediction models and then say, based on our predictions, uh, Biden or Trump is going to win. And uh, they split it up like in two different graphs, one graph for Biden, one graph for Trump, and then added a little summary on there with even like a picture of their face in a nice illustrated way. Yeah, I think I can. Um, yeah, maybe you can. I, th I think I, up. yeah. Um, first I have to I exit have the to full screen. Up. And I think I've got the right link. Um, but this is a Firefox link and you cannot drag a Firefox tab to a Chrome window. That's really complicated. So that's, so I'm going to open a new tab and I'm going to say present, uh, my entire screen. Sure. So then I share this and now you're going to see yourself. Is this the, the thing you were talking about? Um, let me check. no, actually not. Oh, but actually, I yes. okay. Because I, I yeah, I did see this a few times. So there's like this, this prediction graph. Oh, um, this one is way different than what I was thinking of. This is what? This is way different. Uh, oh, this is the primary forecast. It's uh, election forecast that oh, I was good. thinking of. Well, maybe you if can, you just, uh, maybe you can show your screen if you know what you're talking about. It helps oh. a lot. Uh, present now. So many buttons. Mm -hmm. You are presenting and then it's loading. Oh yeah. Oh, and I can still see you as well. This works perfectly. So this one I think is like a oh, very right. nice example. That's if you can see it. Yeah, that's a very nice one indeed. Yeah. Like I think color contrast wise, uh, the gray text doesn't really pass. Yeah. There are some uh, things to improve yeah. still, of course, but, uh, but besides that it really labels like Trump wins in these cases, Biden wins in these cases. And then on top of it, they have like a different way of displaying it. It's basically the exact same data, just two different data visualizations. And also with screen reader, it actually, instead of trying to read each different data points, it just reads the summary. Yeah. And I think for a graph like this, that's actually a pretty good solution. So the, the screen reader tells you what the graph is trying to show instead of every yeah. data point. Yeah, I really like that approach. It doesn't work for everything, but I think for a story that you're trying to tell like this. Yeah, and I think I especially with, a, yeah. with an election with two parties where people really want to yeah. know, hey, is A winning or B winning? Yeah. Then then you've got like two stories to follow. Mm -hmm. So this yeah. was one of the best you found? Yeah, uh, although I also must say that it only worked with a voiceover. I tried using it with narrator on Edge and there it did not read the descriptions as a screen reader. The only thing I got was image. Ah. So that's too bad. But there was an attempt, which is better than most. Yeah, there, there was some improvement at least. Yeah. So what other uh, graphs did you check? Um, I did the New York Times, which was eh, not very great. Uh, the Guardian, which I thought was pretty bad. CNN was quite bad as well. Uh, Fox News, uh, they actually, I could see that they tried to make it accessible, but they made it like accessible in a very unuser friendly way. Uh, let me just uh, double they, check, by the way. The, yeah. the URL was uh, projects.538.com slash 2020 dash election dash forecast. Yep. Then uh, that's the one? Yeah. Then I'll share it in the chat as well. If anybody wants to look it up, then. Uh, and I can share uh, Fox News as well. 
I'll just share my screen again. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see because it's so. I want to say visual, but it's also really actual. Like it, it just happened. So they have this bar here where you can see like Joe Biden, 306 votes, uh, Donald Trump, 232 votes. Yes, the and official outcome, as we can say. <laughs> and they uh, actually added, I can even inspect the element and show you. They added those, first wow. of all, very interesting. They were the only ones that didn't use like SVG or anything. They just made it with diffs, which is an interesting approach. I haven't seen that before. Yeah, lots of diffs. <laughs> And um, they added the 16 votes label and then visually hit it so that this would be read by a screen reader. But then you have the tooltip, which has the display non attribute, so that part doesn't get read. But this is actually the part that contains interesting information. Because yeah. right now, when you look at the screen reader, it just reads 16 votes, 9 votes, 3 votes, 2 votes, <laughs> without knowing who they belong to or where they're coming from. So you're just listening to all the electoral college votes just distributed randomly and you don't and know which all... state it is or yeah. who won it yeah and they have all the information there to make it perfectly accessible and then they did the opposite which was quite interesting yeah and that's the fun part often like if you talk to a developer and you say yeah you've got the information already there and they're like yeah yeah it's easy i can just add it but they just need to know so this one was a uh, the the bar chart was in diffs instead of an SVG. Yeah. Is is the actual yeah. map any better? Uh, I think the actual map was actually just read as an image, if I remember correctly. Or maybe it's actually I could just try it. Yeah, if you've got your audio set up to uh, to share with us, or at least share the conclusion. Google. Elections yeah. 2020 vertical line Fox News Google Chrome election yeah, selected T O to selected tools for designing good looking yeah. accessible elections Sorry. 2020 vertical election 2020 vertical line Fox News. I'm not Voice. going to attempt it because my cursor is jumping everywhere. Okay. I was trying to skip this graph because it would be horrible to listen to all those yeah. votes again. But then I tabbed away and it's stressing me out how loud it gets. Yeah, that's that's how voiceover works and any screen reader, right? Like and then we don't even have it at the speed that some people use it. It's yeah. unbelievable. It's very fun to live with me when I'm testing those things. I think I drove my wife completely wild because I was constantly like testing the same annoying graphs over and over again with voiceover yeah. really loud. And nothing else of the website is accessible either. So she was sitting here like, please. <laughs> Please wear your, your headphones or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got a question in the chat. I'm not sure if you're watching as well, but uh, Yakim says, uh, in accessibility, we focus a lot on physical disabilities. I'd love mm -hmm. to know if you have any tips on how to accommodate for cognitive disabilities. I think this is a good example. Uh, yes. That's what we started with already. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this was a lot of noise, um, like literally. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess you've got visual noise in, in many things as well, right? Yeah, and what I also like is uh, displaying the same information in different ways within the same view where possible. At least uh, from my perspective, like I'd say I have some level of accessibility need there because I have CPTSD, which means that I have periods where I can be very stressed. And when my stress levels get high, it becomes very physical. Like my vision literally blurs and it becomes very hard to think and my heart races and it becomes a physical experience for me as well. And then when I have to look at websites or graphs or do anything under those conditions, it has to be easy and I cannot be confused. It cannot add to the stress because I will start overthinking it and get stuck and it becomes very overwhelming. So something for me that helped me was, um, I like using this as an example because I can really in detail talk through how I felt throughout the entire experience. Uh, which was when I was trying to get in time to the airport. And I had taken uh, a train three hours in advance, or that was my plan. But the trains were on strike. And I was not able to get a Uber. I was not able to get a regular taxi. I had to was in Paris, and I had to run to the other side of Paris within the next 20 minutes to make a train from the other side to yeah. get there. That's how Paris and works it, also, because yeah. all these international <laughs> trains, they are on different stations and everything. It's like... Yeah. Yeah. So it was a big stressful experience and like, oh, we're not going to get home in time from New Year's Eve. This is going to be so horrible. 
and I opened Google Maps when he finally managed to find a taxi. And I think there's a lot that Google Maps can improve with their accessibility as well. But one small thing that I tried to take away from it was that uh, when I opened Google Maps and I tried to look how far away from the airport are we, and there was a traffic jam, it would show me both in red, it's slowing down here, in orange, here it's slowing down, but you're still going to drive. This is going to take approximately five minutes, and it would show that with a symbol and text. And then underneath, it would show me a chart, and then it would have in written text, don't worry, you're still expected to reach your end destination within 20 minutes. Your regular uh, time travel or your regular travel time would have been 15 minutes, but the traffic jam added five minutes. So yeah. I got this information in three different ways and even in clear English language that even said, don't worry, it's about to get better right now. And that's there's, something there's that nothing to... like being too clear. I mean, it's it's <laughs> so comforting, probably. Yeah. yeah. So that's something I always try to take away when when working with DataVis as well. Like, is there a summary I can add? Is there another way besides just a table and a visualization? Is there something that the user might not understand when they're stressed? Or is there something that uh, someone with dyslexia or someone with another cognitive disability might have trouble doing? Like I, I have some friends with ADHD as well that I talk to and that also give me like very interesting perspectives of how they use apps and how some error messages are harder to spot and stuff like that. So I really try to make sure, will everyone be able to get the information they need? Do I need something in two different ways? Try to not overwhelm people with information either. Show the most important thing first and then let them drill down if they need to. And like, it's, it's so much a usability thing, I feel like, because we talk so much about accessibility as is this product accessible? Yes or no? Yeah. And then we, yes, it's accessible. We don't have to do anything anymore. It meets the standards. Yeah. It's like but the it's minimum been, bar has yeah. been reached. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it's way more a usability thing of try to make it as usable as possible and then test it also with disabled people. And then from there, take it. Okay. Not, it's not just meeting the requirements, but how are they actually using it? Is, is it, it easy to use for is them? It's actually nice to use. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. it's one thing the data available, for example, with data is having an accessible table and linking to that. That's a very common approach. And I think it works very well when you're having uh, very short sprints or when you're having a very tight deadline and you just need a first version of your product out there. I think you can say, I'm just going to go with a table and then I'm going to test it with people and next sprint, I will improve on it based on what I've learned. I think it can work in that scenario, but in lots of scenarios, just having an accessible table is not a good experience because you lose all the context and you just have to listen to, in some cases, let's say 300,000 rows of data, which was what we had in one of my previous jobs. No one wants to listen to 300,000 rows with like 10 columns. Like that's... No, it's... I, I can <laughs> imagine that the whole, uh, yeah, like profession of data uh, visualization is about mm -hmm. how can we make data usable and understandable? Yeah. Because yeah. if we didn't need that, you might as well just send huge Excel files to everybody. You wouldn't need data vis at all. Yeah, exactly. And giving somebody just a table, that's like the least you can do, but it's pretty much yeah. the equivalent of giving an Excel file, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, yeah. And that's also one of the main pieces of advice I had before read. Uh, until like not that long ago of when you have data visualization, just treat it as an image and link to a data table in the description. And it's like, yes, data is there, but this is a great experience really, probably yeah. not. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's there and that's about all you can say yeah. about it. So let's imagine now that how many, how many newspapers and things did you check for, for the election? maybe six or seven or something six or seven okay now now let's imagine that all these people are now watching the stream which mm -hmm. would be fun um let's hope that we've got another election like four years away like it's gonna take a long time for them um you can tell them three things what could they improve like could you give them three tips and say like hey for the next election please please improve this 
I think for all of them, it would be screen reader experience. And it's hard to pinpoint to one specific thing there because a lot of them are just failing across the spectrum. Like, <laughs> Where do you even start? <laughs> yeah. Uh, for example, I think it was CNN, but it might be The Guardian. Both of them are really bad with it. Um, when I used it on mobile, it would read each and every single state of the OS as image and nothing else. Image, 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 image. Yep. I think my main tip would actually not be one specific thing to fix, but throughout your process, test this with screen readers and try to test it on different screen readers. Even if you can't find any users to test it with, it's so easy to turn on voiceover and it's so easy to turn on narrator on your laptop. It's in Just there. Just turn it on. Yeah. And yeah, don't let any graph be published until you've gone through with that because it's very hard to even talk about how to improve the experience when the minimum isn't even there yet. Like that's also something I'm trying to tell people that don't postpone accessibility until after you've released your product, because if you release something that's completely inaccessible and you're going to go out and ask for advice on how to fix this, what you're going to get back is just a list of all the requirements you didn't meet and say, I could not test this. It's completely unusable. Yeah. I you imagine asking product, somebody yeah. like, um, You've, you've designed a building and you're asking them, how did you like the building? And the door was locked. So they couldn't yeah, even exactly. get in. Yeah, it's very much like that. We once, yeah. uh, in my previous job, went out uh, to test one of our customers' products. And um, we had, had actually found blind people uh, to use it with screen readers and set an entire day aside. And they opened the product and the first screen that they had to use to get into it had did five it buttons. They were all called button. And they were like, don't even know how to get into your product. Yeah. So my main advice to those people would be make sure that that minimum level at the very least is met, because if you don't have that, you can't even keep improving on it and make it a good experience when you can't even test what the experience is like right now. Yeah. I, I, and, like, like yeah. Why I use this example sometimes in training as well. Um, my local hospital has a new website. And they have this feedback form, which I think is really good. Like if you make something new, you want to test it, you want to get some feedback. Um, but the feedback form isn't accessible. So they're probably yeah. not going to get any feedback on accessibility. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just can't follow that train of thought. It's really. Um... Yeah. It's also how in, in a way, um, Instagram's accessibility features aren't really accessible to turn on, like the um, adding alt text to the images. I wanted to do it for so long and I kept looking for it and I figured there must be no option to add alt text to my Instagram pictures. Yeah. And then someone told me that I had to go under advanced setting every time I posted a picture. You have to open this hidden menu in low contrast text that's like somewhere shoved in the bottom and then find it. And if you edit an old picture that's even more fun, then you cannot see the picture while you're writing the alt text. No. So I wanted to edit my old pictures and I had to like tap out, look what was on the picture, try to remember what I wanted to say, then open the text and then write it and hope I didn't forget the details that I wanted to write about. Yeah. Like, so you get this like yeah. cognitive pressure for helping other people with visual issues. It's like a double, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. It, just like Twitter, it's, it, I, I think you can have alt text on Twitter, but you had to enable it somewhere like deep hidden in the settings. And then yeah. at a certain point, they are, ask people, do you really want to add a description? Like they wanted to oh, make it yeah. even harder. Because, I don't even remember that. Yeah, that was there. So you had this setting and you probably went through a lot of trouble to set it that way. And then they asked, are you really sure you want to do that? Uh, do you really want to add an alt text and help people? Yeah, I, I think I'm pretty sure that I want to do that. Um, and it's easy for, for Twitter. Like they can, tech, they can check if you have alt text or not. So they could just send you a message before you try to tweet. Hey, you didn't add alt text. Do yeah. you want to reconfigure? Make it a required field or something. Yeah. It's like the easiest yeah. they, they could do. Mm -hmm. And and the default alt text right now is image. Mm -hmm. So if somebody doesn't yeah. describe their image, you'll hear image, image, and or image yeah. graphic, or it's yeah. like so mm -hmm. non-descriptive. Uh, I got another question. Um, what are ways to approach user stories in a way that it is inclusive to a wider audience? Or should we be moving to a different model of prioritizing features? So, and the, the idea behind that is that there are many different users and that many different ways of using apps. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to mention one thing first because it's really like mm -hmm. a
pet peeve of mine. Um, mm -hmm. Use defaults, follow conventions, and don't try to reinvent the wheel. Because um, I see so many issues coming up from people trying to, to invent something new. Mm -hmm. um, it's very common these days to create single page applications. And when you make a single page application, you are not making static pages like the way the, the, the web was designed one day back, back, back a long time. Um, so one of the things that you have to reinvent is routing. You don't get routing for free. If you make a single page application, you have to implement routing. You have mm -hmm. to reinvent a wheel and think, how do I want to route people? And every time you do something like this, you, you reinvent something. Um, there are so many things that you have to consider. So I'm just talking about the accessibility part, but there's performance and security as well. If mm -hmm. you reinvent the wheel, there are more factors you have to keep in mind than you'll, than you'll probably be able to consider. Um, so sticking to conventions, that would be one for me. Um, mm -hmm. And that's just my rant. So <laughs> what were you thinking? So for me, it depends a bit. Like in the companies I've worked at before, I wasn't really the one writing the user stories. Uh, but we mainly, and I kind of like the approach also of what you say, stick to the conventions, don't reinvent the wheel. I have used user stories before and in the projects I'm doing right now as well. It's also a bit more like user stories, but I just make sure that we add user stories or that we add a requirement for other things. And I also add uh, right now for each feature that we are discussing, I make people fill in and I fill it in myself as well, like a risk benefit and how to mitigate the risk and accessibility can be part of that as well to just when you write something, oh, as a user, I have to be able to interact with this button this has to do something whatever they also write this also includes like just be more specific there and say okay that means that for screen readers this will have this and this and this application implication that we have to think of uh if i'm a non-binary person commenting on this field or writing a public comment i might get harassment if i if it's uh an algorithm using facial detection, it might be racist. Just map out those things together with the user stories is kind of an approach I've been taking. And that, at least in my case for this project is working really well. But I also know that that's something that can be hard to get in corporate environments where people already have processes in place when those don't include inclusivity or accessibility. Yeah, and I, I think you, you... Hard. Yeah. I think you benefit from the diversity of the people that fill it in then, right? Yeah. But it can be quite hard to feel to introduce, like trying to bring accessibility on the roadmap in larger companies or in places where management doesn't have it. So it can be a bit, yeah. At and least it... I've noticed before that when I'm like, we have to think about accessibility. And you mentioned user specific. testing. I think that's also yeah. like. Yeah. Have you ever had a user test that didn't surprise you? No. There's always something new, I guess. So that's... Uh... Yeah, user tests are, are very good. And I feel like it's something that in general in this industry, I feel like we're not doing enough user tests. And I think it's a funny thing because I think the more budget you would give me and or the bigger a project would become, the more I'd even be like, we need still more user tests. I think you could give me at the end of each project three weeks extra, and I'd still be like, I think we could still benefit from another user test because yeah. they're so valuable to have. I don't think you have, can have too many user tests or too much input from users. It's so valuable to get everyone's perspective. Do you also implement then something to make sure that you get feedback after lunch? Uh, depends on the product. Like uh, in, in some products, we have added like analytics to see um, how people are using it. But of course, that doesn't necessarily also when it comes to accessibility, take that into account. Because you can't necessarily see like, are people using screen reader or which one are they using and stuff like that. Uh, so we've done that. But I also, especially for personal projects, I try to stay away from data gathering because I just don't want... I just don't want to do it on my own projects. It doesn't feel yeah. worth it in that regard. Because talking about personal projects, uh, you also mm -hmm. stream, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <While> <laughs> <drinking>. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what kind of stuff do you stream these days? 
uh lately it's been mainly been animal crossing yeah because i've been so busy with work that in the evening i'm just like i want to play games and i'll just stream myself but i'm actually planning on streaming some css art this weekend i'm thinking sunday afternoon i will set my afternoon aside and make some artwork with css which yeah. will be really fun and are you working on another website as well Yes, I'm redesigning my portfolio and I'm also making a little online resource library, uh, which is for accessibility and ethical design resources, or uh, I call it mainly ethical design resources, but that includes accessibility because I think the two are connected because so often people ask me like at work or whenever I talk about anything like this, people are like, what can I read now? Where should yeah. I go? And I got tired of sending the same links over and over again. So I'm just yeah. going to make a directory where I can insert everything interesting I come across. And can we find this online somewhere already or? Not yet. Not but yet. my goal is to launch it before Christmas. Yeah. So everybody can read it. during their vacation. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I started building it this summer. Like after vacation, I was so motivated. I was like, I'm going to make this. And then I did the same as what so many people do with their side projects. After a week of working on it, I was like, oh, God. This is a side project. I have to start another side project to relax from this. And then I put another. <laughs> I'm one of those people that start side projects. Yeah. Yeah. And one side project is not a side project. So you need more than yeah. one. Yeah. Exactly. And then you need another side project to distract yourself from the first one because you're getting burned out from it. And then you end up with 20 unfinished ones. <laughs> yeah. Well, Animal Crossing is good for that, I guess. Yeah. It's very nice. It's completely unrelated, but if you ever want an Amiibo card, let me know and I can send you one. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> we, we make our own, so it uh, makes it oh, really nice. easy. Um, so, so do you have any plans for your stream? Is your stream a side project? Yeah, sort of. Or I'm, I don't want to treat it too much as like a fixed project because then it adds pressure to have to do it on a regular basis. And I already have quite a bit going on. Like I'm yeah. also volunteering for Oslo Pride, making their websites together with another nice. team. And I'm going to start volunteering for my wife's organization, which is a patient organization for trans people trying to improve the healthcare. And they need a website as well. So I'm going to start doing that too. Yep. So Everybody needs websites. Stream. Yeah. <laughs> so my stream is just going to be whenever I feel like it. Yeah. No, no KPIs or goals no. <laughs> on the on the horizon or anything no. and your personal website what's the what's the plan with that then uh so i'm actually adding a proper cms to it called sanity i don't know if you've heard of it yeah so that's uh, markdown yeah. based i think uh yeah or it's it has an interface I dog. <laughs> yeah <laughs> dog one of course um, so it's, a, it's very nice. It's a Norwegian company. Unfortunately, the name is a bit ableist, but it's actually a very, it's so flexible because you have the interface in the backend, but you can completely in uh, markdown format, uh, not markdown, sorry, JSON format, uh, define what inter like which fields you get and you can make it uh, required to add alt text to images, which I really like. Yeah. Uh, when I'm making it for other people, I always make it required and make sure that they get a nice error message when there's no alt text to their pictures. Uh, so like you can be very flexible in what you're adding. And I really wanted to have an interface that I could easily push through from my mobile because this summer while traveling, uh, we did a road trip in Norway with our tents and I wanted to write stuff for my blog, but I did not want to write markdown and push to GitHub from my phone. I was like, nope. <laughs> There are limits, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not even going to attempt that. So I'm adding that to it. And while I'm at it, I'm just going to redo the entire design because every not? time is, yeah. As soon as I design something, I get tired of it. So then I have to redo it. <laughs> and would you uh, recommend it to other people as well? Have your website, have your own website? Yeah. I, I think it's, uh, I mean, I think if you're working in tech or design, it's a, uh, very fun place to just experiment with new technologies or experiment with new designs and it's a good place to let your creativity loose a bit like that yeah but it's also really nice writing and just having even though i'm not doing it very often and my articles tend to be a bit long so they need a bit more research every time 
but still it's nice to have this one thing each month that I'm just like, I'm going to try to push this out and work on it. And it's like this nice little goal that motivates myself as well to read more about different subjects and keep learning as well. It's a good excuse for many things, right? Yeah. <laughs> and is there, un, uh, is there going to be any data visualization on your website then? Not yet, but I'm, I've been wanting to do this in 2020 and I didn't have the time for it, which is that I wanted to make something of like a report of my entire year where I each month will collect a little bit of data and make a little report of it. Yeah. I'm, I'm probably going to be the, like the, the thousand person to say this, but a bit like a Feltron report or. Yeah. But yeah, I did not have time in 2020, but it's, I'm hoping I can prioritize it in 2021 because I'd like to have some data this fun. Yeah. At, le at least you didn't count your steps or lo your location in 2020 while you stayed at home. So that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. that's a good, good one, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I get these update emails from Google every now and then, like your activity on Google Maps, and uh, like I went nowhere the entire year. Yeah. So what are you gonna share? Yeah, my iPhone did the same. Like I, I recently got an Apple Watch, like upgraded it, and it wanted to show me how my activity had changed since last time I was wearing an Apple Watch, and it was really like your steps went down at twenty thousand a day or something like yeah. that. Like, yeah, yeah, Sorry. start moving. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm just gonna sit here. Yeah. <laughs> not gonna happen apple watch sorry about that uh so so what are your plans for the near future because uh it's december so you've been mm -hmm. in your job for like three months mm -hmm. you've had some personal milestones you have some nice projects to to mm -hmm. to side project on yeah so do you have a, oh, it's it feels like a dangerous question but do you have plans for 2021 yeah, well, one of my goals was uh, to give my first conference talk, and I just got accepted for uh, XCOM. Yeah, congratulations. So there I will be talking about uh, an introduction to accessible data visualizations, which will be really exciting. Yeah. And I uh, submitted another talk together with two other people to Outlier Conference, but we don't know yet if we are accepted or not. Yeah. Really hope we do. It will also be about uh, accessible data vis. So those are... At least one of my goals there is met already. And other than that, I just want to continue doing... Oh, sorry. My wife entered the apartment and the dog is going wild. Of course. So yeah, other than that, I just want to continue doing what I'm doing. Uh, try to prioritize writing articles a bit more often. Because in my previous job, I, especially during the pandemic, I worked in ad tech. That was my last job. And when suddenly everyone had to work from home and do homeschooling, our sales boomed and we suddenly had a lot of work to do. So I yeah. didn't have that energy for side projects, but now I'm getting the energy again. So I want to write more and probably pick up like five more side projects after I finish these. <laughs> Your side projects need side projects. Yeah. yeah. And do you have any subjects in mind that you want to write about? Uh, I wanted to write more about... Um, accessible data with D3 because I wrote one approach that you could take and I want to explore some different approaches and that would be one thing. I definitely want to do more about like trans inclusive design and non-binary inclusive design. Probably want to make a talk about it eventually as well. Yeah. So those are two big things. I think people would be really interested in, in knowing more about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's also a very fun subject to think about. Good. I'm looking forward Sorry, to it by my dog being very happy to see oh my that's wife. perfect i i've <laughs> asked you so many questions already and i've learned a lot so i'm just gonna ask this once to the chat are there any questions more for sarah and if we get no uh no new questions right now they can always find you on twitter right you're pretty active yes we are on twitter i can send the link in the chat because i yeah. have it open up that's that's this, the whole interactive part of twitch right mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'm just really looking forward to whatever's coming up. I'm, I'm keeping track. You probably mm -hmm. noticed I keep track of everything you do. No, not everything. <laughs> yeah. But I, I will notice, hopefully. Um, mm -hmm. And I just want to thank you a lot for joining me. And I want to wish yeah, you the best with yeah. your talks. Uh, I you. hope people will, will learn a lot. And uh, just enjoy your time with your wife and your dog. Have a nice thank evening. Thank you. Yeah? Yes, you as well. And thank you for having me. Thank you very Glad much. And I'm going to press the stop streaming button. So yep. people will stop seeing you. Thank you very much for watching, everybody. And uh, if you are having a evening, have a good evening. 
And if it's a morning, a good morning or wherever you are, good luck. Enjoy your time.